So hi, my name is Michelle Schultz. I'm one of the physical therapists at REACT's Lakeshore East Clinic location. And we are located off of Columbus and Randolph, right behind the Blue Cross Blue Shield building. I've been treating here for a year now. And as a former gymnast, I tend to see a lot of dancers and other gymnasts that present with hip impingement. And Rebecca Wolnitz is also going to be hosting this presentation with me today. And I'll have her come in and introduce herself. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I also am at our Lakeshore East Clinic. Um, I've been treating now about five years. I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, I treat both orthopedic conditions, but I also specialize in treating um, pelvic floor conditions, um, other women's health conditions, which is often pretty relevant with hip impingement because um, there can be pelvic floor dysfunction too. Um, so just keep that in mind and we'll get going. Okay, and then Ashley Honan is our Director of Business Development and she's also gonna be helping us out, flag us down if we have any questions um, that you guys may have during this webinar um, if I don't see them in the chat. And just a little background about REACT. Um, we are a boutique style outpatient physical therapy clinic with six clinics around Chicago land area and the north suburbs. We focus on a whole body one-on-one -on -one approach here. And at our specific location in Lakeshore East, we have therapists with a array of specialties. Like Rebecca said, she's a women's health therapist. And we also have a vestibular therapist here. And with each of us having a little bit different of a background, we emphasize a collaborative approach. So if we feel that you may benefit from one of our other specialties, um, then we'll be able to collaborate with each other about that. We are offering telehealth as well as in clinic services during this time. And if you are ever interested in coming in for our services, we can get you in quite quickly. In Illinois, we also have direct access laws, meaning that you don't need a script to come in for physical therapy services. Um, we'll just verify your insurance beforehand so you know your benefits up front. Um, and then we also offer complimentary injury screens as well. And before we get started, if you guys have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to place them in the chat box. Either me or Rebecca will be watching the chat box throughout. So um, if you want to have a question about a certain slide that we're on or something that we're talking about, we'll let each other know um, as we go. And, and if anyone misses anything and you don't put it in the chat box, you can always rewatch this recording. Um, and these slides will be posted on our website for you to view at a later time. So to get started, the anatomy of the hip. So the hip is a ball and socket joint. The socket is formed by the acetabulum. So I'm pulling my mouse over. So here is the ball and here's the socket. So the acetabulum is the socket right here. And it's part, part of the larger pelvis bone here. The ball is the femoral head right here, which is at the upper end of the femur. So this is the femur and this is the top of the femur and the femoral head um, inserts into the acetabulum um, to form the ball and socket joint of the hip. There's a slippery tissue called articular car cartilage that covers the surface of the ball and the socket. It creates a smooth, low friction surface that helps the bones glide easily across each other during movement. And the acetabulum is ringed by a strong fibrocartilage called the labrum. And the labrum forms a gasket around the socket, creating a tight seal and helping to provide stability of the joints. And with the hip having large ranges of motions in all planes, it requires significant stability by the capsule, the surrounding muscles, and the labrum. The surrounding muscles then work in a reciprocal fashion at the hip joint in order to create the stability at the hip joint. So in the front of the leg, which we'll see over here on the right hand picture, we have the psoas muscle and we have the rectus femoris muscle. Oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, so these two muscles specifically are our main hip flexors. So when we sit in a prolonged position, um, in hip flexion, these muscles tend to get tight. And this is one of the aggravating symptoms as well for hip impingement. And then on the posterior side, over here, um, we have the gluteal muscles that work 
effectively to pull the head of the femur into the acetabulum, which is important for creating overall improved stability at the hip joint and the pelvic girdle. So what is hip impingement? Hip impingement, also known as FII, occurs when the femoral head, so the ball of the hip, pinches up against the acetabulum, which is the socket or the cup of the hip. And when this happens, damage to the labrum or the cartilage that surrounds the acetabulum can occur, causing hip stiffness and pain and can lead to arthritis. So I'm gonna pull up this YouTube video that kind of shows the motion. I don't know if you guys will be able to hear this, but if you don't, it doesn't matter. The hip joint is made up of the femur, the pelvis, and soft tissues called the articular cartilage and the labrum. The labrum is a rubbery ring of cartilage that seals the joint. It also acts as a shock absorber. The cartilage and labrum allow the hip bones to move smoothly. If these bones are in an abnormal shape, they can damage the soft tissues, cause pain, and limit the range of motion of the hip. This is called a femoroacetabular impingement, or FAI. All right. There it is. So the types of hip impingement, there are two main types. The first is called a cam lesion and is caused by a deformity of the femoral head or the ball of the hip. In this type of impingement, the ball has a more oval than round appearance due to the development of an outcropping or a callus formation, which is created with friction from constant repetitive movements when the ball hits the edge of the cup or the socket. The second type is a pincer morphology, which occurs when the acetabulum or the cup or the socket is abnormally shaped. The cup may cover the head or the femur just too much, creating friction when the edge of the cup hits the ball or the head or neck of the femur. And it is also possible to have a combination of both of these. For many people, the abnormal shape is thought to be present since birth, but it's also possible to develop this abnormal shape over time and is seen more frequently in young athletes that participate in sports involving a lot of twisting and the hips and squatting. Just like I said, when I am seeing those dancers and the gymnasts. All right, so we're going to get into a little bit about the symptoms that you may experience. Um, so this picture is showing um, the a pain distribution where you may experience symptoms. So typically with hip impingement, pain is predominantly experienced in the groin um, or the front of the, the thigh kind of through this area, sometimes down into a little bit further down into the thigh as well. Um, often that pain is usually um, felt deep in the hip and um, as um, we have what people call or what we refer to as the C sign. So it's the shape of the hand um, over the side of the hip, um, just forms the shape of a C. Um, some people will also experience pain on the outside of the hip. So kind of through here, um, the, the buttock on the backside over here, and then sometimes low back pain as well, but usually um, there's almost always pain in the front here and that groin or kind of the front of that hip with the hip impingement. So since hip impingement um, typically stems from a structural issue, the onset of pain is usually gradual and it's not usually related to any kind of trauma. Most people will, will report uh, discomfort with sitting, leaning forward, getting up from a seat, um, getting into or out of a car, um, and often pain can be aggravated by more physical activity like walking, running, pivoting, squatting. Um, and then, so the characteristics of pain, a lot of people will report um, pain is dull, achy, kind of that constant 
nagging type pain. Um, and then occasionally there will be sharp pain, um, either with like rotational motions or the kind of end range of motion, like maybe with squatting. Some people can also experience mechanical features, um, such as a pop, catch, lock, snap, or um, stiffness in the hip as well. So there are a few clinical tests that doctors and physical therapists will use to identify the possibility of hip impingement. Um, the first one is a FADIRS test. So it stands for flexion, um, hip flexion, hip adduction, and then hip internal rotation. So three different motions of the hip. Um, and then Faber's test um, is made up of three motions, hip flexion, hip abduction, and hip external rotation. And we'll, we're going to demonstrate these motions that, you, that you'll be able to, to test to. Um, and then the functional squat as well. Um, both the Fadir's test and the Faber's test are considered sensitive tests. So this means that if they are positive for pain, that there is usually likely um, hip impingement. Um, okay, so I'm going to exit this screen and we're going to, Michelle's going to demonstrate. I'm going to walk her through. Just stop sharing your screen. Yeah. Okay, so you should just be able to see our video. So the first one that Michelle's going to do is the Fadir test. So she's going to go into hip flexion first and then adduction. So she's going to go a little bit more midline and then she's going to add a little bit of internal rotation. So her foot is going to swing out a little bit. Okay. And the next one is a Faber's test. And yet yeah, usually you, you do want to test both sides. Um, when you're doing that self-assessment. Um, during the motions, you might feel tightness or some discomfort, but it should replicate your exact symptoms that you're experiencing if it is a true positive. So it's good to do it on both sides, um, to do on the, the side that's not painful first, so you have an idea of what it should feel like, and then you test the painful side to see if it is truly a hip impingement. The next test will be the Faber's test. So that's the hip flexion. So she's gonna bring it towards her torso. Then she's gonna bring her hip out to the side for abduction and she's gonna let her foot turn and rest her foot on the um, top of her other thigh. Um, if it's hip impingement, she should feel some pain or discomfort in that front of that hip, so that groin area. Um, this test, you may feel some symptoms, you may feel tightness or discomfort in the back of the hip. Um, that would not be positive for hip impingement. It would just be, it could be like SI joint um, dysfunction or something like that, but not hip impingement. So it's almost like she's doing a little figure four there. And then she's going to go ahead and stand up. And sorry, we're gonna bring this up a little bit. And she's gonna do a functional squat. So she's just gonna squat down as far as she can. And what we're looking for is to see if she has any pain in the front of her hip. If she doesn't have any pain in front of that hip, there's probably, um, there may not be hip impingement. So just kind of a three quick ways to get a sense to see if you, you may have symptoms of hip impingement. So what we're gonna do next, um, so if you think you have hip impingement, um, or you know maybe you did some of those tests and they did show to be positive, um, we're gonna show a couple exercises that we can do to address, um, to help either reduce or eliminate symptoms and improve hip mobility. Um, as well as strength. So the first one is gonna be a hip flexor release. So what she's gonna do, she's gonna use a lacrosse ball and she's gonna find her hip bone and her belly button. And she's gonna go pretty much on a diagonal halfway between those two points. Okay, so it should be on the inside of that hip bone. You shouldn't be on bone when you're doing that. And what she's gonna do, she's gonna put the ball there at that spot and she's gonna lay on the ground. 
and she's gonna lift that knee that's the same side that she placed the ball and she's gonna do a little windshield wipe. So she's just gonna let her leg go back and forth. This should be mildly uncomfortable. It shouldn't cause any sharp pain. So if it does, you may need to um, adjust where the ball is. Um, but I would do, you know, between 10 to 20 repetitions or maybe up to a minute of repeating on this side. So that's for the hip flexor. The next one that we're gonna show is a quadriceps release. So that, that rectus femoris often, so that, that muscle crosses the hip. So a lot of times that muscle will get tight. So we're gonna use a foam roller um, to get that quad um, to release a little bit. So Michelle's gonna lay on the foam roller, almost like she's gonna do a plank. So she's on her forearms and she's gonna start right below that hip crease. And she's just gonna bend and straighten her knee. And because the quadriceps muscle is a big muscle, it runs all the way down to the knee, um, it's okay to go further down when you're doing this. So you wanna hit a few different spots in the quadriceps muscle. So you can lay directly on it. Um, if you wanted to, you could rotate a little bit so you're getting a little bit more of that outside of the, the quad. Um, so she could rotate yeah, away. Might be a little bit more painful. And probably, you know, around 10 to 20 repetitions at each spot. Um, again, it should be um, mildly just uncomfortable. It shouldn't cause any sharp pain. If it is, um, you might have to readjust um, to, to do the exercise. So those are two good um, muscle, active muscle releases. This next one that she's going to show, she's going to um, show a hip mobilization. So this one requires a pretty tight band um, if you're going to use a resistance band. Otherwise, a belt might be um, good to use. So she's going to place that band in that hip crease, kind of in that groin. And one knee is going to stay up. So the knee, the, the hip that has the band is going to stay down. She's going to get into a half kneeling position. And she's going to use her glutes. So she has the band around her right side. She's going to use her glutes on her right side to squeeze them and help her lean forward, almost like a little mini lunge. So that belt is giving her a glide backwards, help open up that hip joint a little bit more. And then she can go to the side as well. So if she angles herself, So she's a little bit more on a diagonal now. Um, she's gonna just still kind of push towards her left knee. So she's pushing out to the side a little bit more. That band's still around her right hip. And we'll just show you on the left hip too. The left hip stays down. She's gonna squeeze that left glute to help push her hip forward. And then she's gonna bring her leg, her right leg out a little bit to the side so that she's gonna get a little bit more of a side glide. Yeah, I think so. A little bit more to the side there. And again, probably around 20 repetitions for each direction. It should feel pretty good. It should feel like a nice stretch in the front of that hip. So those three are good for um, addressing um, pain and mobility, um, so any stiffness. The next two that we'll go over are strengthening exercises. So they focus a little bit more on the glutes. Um, glute strengthening is a good way to increase hip 
um, increase lumbopelvic stability and hip stability um, and control the femur with upright activities, but it's also helpful in lengthening your hip flexors, especially because those tight hip flexors can aggravate that hip pain. So the first one that she's gonna do, she's gonna do an elevated bridge. So she's gonna use a bench here, but you can use a couch um, at home or maybe a coffee table to do this. And she's just gonna place her heels on the, the bench and she's just gonna lift up. So she's getting, going through a lot more range of motion than just having her feet on the ground. So she's really using her glutes through that entire range of motion. She should also get a nice stretch in the front of her hips. She should not feel anything in her back when doing a, a bridge like this. Um, if so, she might need to move a little bit closer to the bench or the couch, or she might need to modify how high the surface is that, her, that she's pushing through, maybe a little bit lower surface. And I would start two to three um, sets of 10 to really get those glutes burning. All right, so then the last one that we're gonna go through for hip strengthening, those glute strengthening are clamshells. So Michelle's gonna lay on her side and she's gonna start with her hips bent and her knees and her feet a little bit behind her. She's gonna keep her ankles together and lift her top knee away from her bottom leg and then back down. With this, she may need to, so you shouldn't have your, let your pelvis rock backwards. Your pelvis should stay stacked on top of each other. So she may, if she were to, if her hips were moving backwards, she may need to keep her hand on her hip to prevent her from rocking. And when she's doing this, she should feel this in her glutes. She doesn't wanna feel it in her inner thighs or her quads. If that's the case, we may need to modify her position a little bit. So we may need to straighten her hips out a little bit if she were feeling it somewhere else to get a little bit more glute activation. And with this, you can add resistance. You can add a band around her knees to make it a little bit more effective with strengthening. And again, I would start two to three sets of 10 repetitions kind of depending on how quickly you fatigue or you know, if you start feeling it somewhere else, you may just be fatiguing quickly. Good. All right, we'll screen share again. When should you go see your doctor? So conservative management for your symptoms are first recommended, including rest, activity modification, anti-inflammatory medications, and physical therapy. However, if your pain does not improve with these interventions, I as a physical therapist will refer you back to go see your doctor. The diagnosis for hip impingement or FAI is made on a number of factors, including history, physical exam, and imaging. X-rays will need to be done and an MRI scan is often required to evaluate the soft tissues of the hip. If deemed that the structural changes of the hip are evolved, increasing your risk of developing arthritis, surgical management may be indicated. And there are two main goals of surgical treatment. The first is to address the damaged portion of the hip joint, which may involve repairing or removing damaged tissue. And the second is to correct or improve the abnormal shape of the hip joint. This is often done arthroscopically by removing extra bone. 
Does anyone have any questions about anything that we presented today? If so, just place them in the chat. And stay on here for a few minutes if someone has anything they would like to say. Okay. And here is our contact information. Um, so our emails are listed underneath our names and this is the address of the clinic that we're specifically located in the Lakeshore East location. You're welcome, Diane. <laughs> so if there are no other, if anyone doesn't have any questions, feel free to reach out to either of us if you think of anything later. Um, if you have any questions about, um, you know, gymnasts or um, anything like that, or even pelvic floor dysfunction and hip pain, um, feel free to reach out at us um, at any point in time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.